Here. 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 Here, we have a full house this evening, at least up at the dais. Um, <laughs> next up on the agenda is approval of the meeting agenda. Are there any additions or modifications to the meeting agenda this evening? Hearing none, I'd take a motion to approve the meeting agenda. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. And the meeting agenda is approved. Next up is a approval of the consent agenda. The only item on the consent agenda this evening is the minutes of the regular meeting of the Planning Commission from November 13. Are there any modifications, additions, subtractions to the minutes from November 13? Seeing none, I'd take a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. And a second? Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign and the consent agenda is approved. Next up is the community comment portion of the meeting. This is the portion of the meeting where we invite members of the public to comment on items that are not on the agenda this evening. And so if you're here for community comment, this would be a good time. All right, so seeing no volunteers for community comment, I would uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, reports and recommendations. And the first item up, is a visit from Cindy Larson, the city's residential development coordinator. Cindy, welcome. We've been looking forward to a visit from you. Good evening, Chair Staunton and Commissioners. I'm Cindy Larson, Residential Redevelopment Coordinator for the City of Edina. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight to provide you with an update on the redevelopment happenings. Tonight I'll be covering common concerns, current remedies, effective policies, and next steps. Please note my slides have changed since the packet went out to you, so I'll be working from the new slides, which you should have in front of you. The most common concerns are listed here. I'm going to just simply read through this list, and then on the next slide, I'll be breaking it down for you further. Miscellaneous general questions, parking, drainage and impervious surface coverage questions, street conditions, construction hour questions and complaints, safety concerns, property damage, encroachment con questions, and tree removal concerns. As you'll see on the chart here, I've broken down the redevelopment topics by percent. The largest portion is miscellaneous or general questions with 29%. And in this area, it includes primarily questions um, pertaining to pre-construction questions, from residents who see signs going up in their neighborhood. They call wondering about the process, inquiring about building plans. I also get a fair amount of questions from current builders as well as potential builders on the code requirements for clarification purposes. And I also take a number of calls in connection to topics that aren't necessarily covered in Section 411 things such as additions, remodels, large landscaping plans. I get all sorts of questions that don't particularly tie into 411, but I still work through them and find remedies for them. The largest issue that I deal with is parking. As you'll see, it's listed at 23%. And simply put, the high volume of complaints in this category is due to narrowed streets due to the construction crew parking. Drainage and impervious surface category is at 9%. And typically here, residents call concerned about uh, maybe a house with a larger footprint going in. They're wondering how that might impact drainage onto their property, and as well as grade changes 
um, that often creates a potential concern. Streets with 8% includes tracking of sediment, residents concerned about heavy equipment driving on the streets, and placement of materials in the right of way. Construction hour questions and violations is at 8%, and this deals with complaints about non-compliant builders working out of code, and general questions about what the hours are. There has been a fair amount of confusion with new hours coming into play. There were already houses being built during that time that were grandfathered in. So there's, there's been a fair amount of confusion on it and people call often to clarify which house falls into which category. Health and safety with 5% includes things like site protection and foundation fencing. And then some of the less frequently heard concerns include property damage at 3%. This is claims regarding damage to things such as fences, sprinkler heads, and landscaping. Neighborhood meeting questions is just at 2%, and that's when residents receive a neighborhood meeting notification, and they contact me to figure out what's going on, um, find out what information I might have for them, and what what I can tell them about the potential building process. Encroachment questions deals with all kinds of things um, related to lot line disputes, ownership of trees, location of fences, and then tree removal. I, I have had some calls from residents about concerned about the loss of trees on a neighboring property. Other concern topics include noise volume, erosion and dust at 2%. The tools we currently use to remedy these issues include simply working with the builders on code, comp code compliance. That includes talking to them about their street sweeping, their erosion protection, safety fence, placement of materials, where they're parking, and the construction hours. Parking, the parking concern, I work really closely with the police department on this. Um, oftentimes, I'll take a look at the situation when a call comes in, I'll go out and take a look, and then I'll contact the police department if I see that there is an issue. Um, if I, I didn't see an issue, I'll revisit, so if I went in the morning, I might go in the afternoon, take another look, and the police department makes the ultimate decision on whether they're going to post a restriction. Typically, they will post on the opposite side of the street that the project is on so that there isn't construction crews walking in the street. And they just want to make sure that there's always um, the ability for traffic to flow on that street. Also, we recently offered the former public works site facility as a sort of park and ride option where, where crews can meet and take less cars out to the project. To date, that hasn't been utilized um, as much as I would like to see. I'm, I'm optimistic that with winter, they'll try to work something out. The response that I've gotten is that typically the people need their vehicle because that's where their tools and equipment are. So um, it's something that we're, we're going to continue to work on. Coordination of efforts with multiple city departments to answer questions and remedy issues. A lot of times when a call comes in, especially as this was a new position for both myself and the city, when, when a call would come in, I would need to coordinate and collaborate with a number of different departments depending on what the issue is. So I work a fair amount with the building, engineering, police, and public works department. I also set up meetings between builders and residents for items such as damage or encroachment claims. I serve as sort of a liaison in those um, meetings to get the two parties together to talk and find a remedy to, this, to the issue. And of course, stop work orders, escrow funds, and citations are great tools to have for non-compliance. And I will report that I have not had to use any of these items. I have been close, 
Um, but people are, are listening and abiding by the guidelines that I've been giving them to date. So to date, we haven't had to do any of those items. Effective policies, policies that I see working well is, this is a really simple one, but it works great, and that's the requirement to have a sign on the site. This is great for both the residents and myself because it provides instant access to contact information. Those signs are required to have the builder's contact information as well as a number here for the city and the street address. So when a resident calls with the street address, it, it's a lot quicker for me to respond versus saying a certain block and then I have to figure out which house it is from there. And also, I use the signs more than anybody, when I'm out on a site, when I see an issue, I walk up to the sign, I call the builder, I say I'm at such and such an address, here's what I'm seeing, and so it's very instantaneous. The neighborhood meetings are a great way for the residents to ask their specific questions to the builder. And it's, it also puts a face with a name so that they see who's going to be working in their neighborhood. The pre-demolition site inspection is something that I've just recently got involved with. And this is an opportunity for me to get out onto the project and look for the signage, proper construction entrance, and sediment and erosion control protection. I also use this as an opportunity to talk to the crew if I see something that might be a potential issue once they get going to talk to them about it before, before they start doing any work. So site specific, if I see a red flag for something, it's a great time to talk to them before they're gonna get going. Next steps. This is, these are the areas that I feel will be valuable to address next. The first is enforcement protocol, as I've mentioned briefly before that with the two sections of code that talk about construction hours there's been a lot of confusion between residents builders and city staff um, one thing that we're, we just recently worked out is there's going to be stickers on a number of items such as the inspection record the plans items that are on site so demolitions and rebuilds will have fluorescent colored stickers on those items. So for instance, if the police get a, a phone call that there's a violation, they can go out to the site and they don't have to guess, is this a, a remodel or is it a new construction? Um, there, because there has been a fair amount of confusion over that. And then with the violation remediation policies, this is something that I want to solidify on ways to remedy violations uh, to clarify what our requirements are so that people can achieve compliance. Drainage policy review. It's my understanding that our engineering department is about 80% complete with a draft policy that would incorporate reviewing the drainage calculations showing the rate and volume is not being increased with the construction of a new house. This impl implementation of a policy of this nature would drastically reduce the drainage concerns. Dust control policy, I'd like to create a policy requiring all materials that are going to be subject to wrecking to be thoroughly dampened with water to prevent dust during the demolition process. I've seen that this is done in some neighboring cities and I think it's a simple thing for us to do to avoid the dust issues during the demolition. Website presence for redevelopment. I'm currently working with communications to incorporate an online complaint form and as well as an area on our city's website to provide information for both builders and residents so it's more hands-on, easily accessible to them. Creation of critical topic handouts. This is something that I want to do with the demolition and new construction permits so that it provides additional information at that time 
Simple things like what's required on that site signage. A sample of a neighborhood letter and information that's relevant and important to the neighbors to get at that time. And then installation specs for the construction entrance and sediment control. I feel the website data and handouts would be a useful way to better communicate some of the communications regarding our policies. And lastly, the council work session is planned for early 2014, I believe the end of January, where I will meet with them to clear any gray areas within the code. And with that, I'm looking forward to hearing your suggestions, insight, and any questions that you might have for me. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, it's good to have you here. Uh, I think this is a, a visit we were looking forward to because we spend a lot of our time um, looking at, reviewing, revising the rules that the um, the developers are going to play by, but we uh, don't often see much about how they get enforced and the mechanics of enforcement in the field. And I think that's a, at least as important as whatever rules we adopt is making sure that uh, those people who are, are bound by them are actually following them in the field. So. Um, questions for um, Ms. Larson. Commissioner Grable. Um, <clears throat> question I have <clears throat> relates around enforcement. What are, uh, what are the enforcement mechanisms? I mean, suppose you go out and the builder's doing something wrong and uh, you recommend that a stop work order is placed on. Um, so what happens if a stop work order is written up? What, who enforces that? order and make sure that the work actually stops. The stop work orders are issued through the building official. So if an instance were to occur where a stop work order was deemed necessary, which is typically if it's a safety issue, I would work with Steve Kirchman on that and, and move forward with it through him. Just following up on that, is that um, is is Steve issuing the stop work order for any department? So if there's an engineering issue, or if there's a planning issue, or if there's a building issue, or if there's a construction practices issue? That I'm not sure. I know that in Section 411, it specifically calls out that it's done by the building official. So, and just to you know, I think it's important to clarify for people who might be watching, when you keep referring to 411, because it can be confused with another 411 that we use as shorthand, that is a section, that is the new section of the city code that pertains to what? Demolition permits and building permits for single and two family dwelling units. And is that the scope of your responsibility as administration of section 411? That's correct. Okay, so if it, and 1040 is the section that the building official works with, correct? 1040 addresses um, the cons cons allow construction hours or noise related oh, it's a nuisance, activity. Um, okay. Correct, nuisance ordinance. And then you've got the building code, and then you may have <laughs> engineering, you may have watershed district, you may have planning, um, public works. Um, but your, the scope of your responsibilities is, um, is for just the administration of that new Section 411. That's correct. Okay. Other questions? Commissioner Platter. Yeah, just, you know, overall, how are, <clears throat> how are residents doing with this? Are they, they see it as a <clears throat> positive thing? Are you seeing um, good outcomes come out of it, or are there still a lot of questions around it? Kind of the same thing with the builders. Are they kind of catching on to this, or are they still whatever they're doing. So just curious from, a, from an enforcement, not necessarily enforcement, but what you're doing out there and how that's affecting the whole area, if you could comment on that. Certainly. There definitely was a learning curve, um, and that takes place any time a new builder comes into the city to do work. It, it's a lot easier to meet with them um, early on, and a lot of people are proactive and they do call, which is great. Um, People are very receptive. Um, as, as 
the policies get rolled out, they're, they're <coughs> listening. When I, t when I tell them something needs to be fixed within two days, it's fixed. So it is working. As far as the residents, um, you know, I can't make everybody happy. Right. And, and a lot of <laughs> no times chance. if it's an issue um, with surveys, surveys bring up a lot of issues because a new survey will be done for the home. The neighboring property maybe hasn't had one since the 50s, and they come out and stake, and it's different from what the, re the adjacent resident thought. And the city uh, can't get involved in, in that dispute. If, if the adjacent neighbor has a dispute, I recommend that they also get a survey, an updated survey, to see where, where their property lines come out. So sometimes the expectation is a little bit high on what can and can't be fixed through this code. And then just a suggestion, I don't know if you're doing a lot of stuff on the website, has it been considered having a map of the city where things are going on? You know, in other words, where projects are happening? That hasn't been discussed yet with communications. Um, it is something that long term would be very ideal. See, I don't know, Minneapolis has a map they publish, at least with commercial projects. I know it comes in the Southwest <laughs> Journal, and you see all the things on there. So something web-based to get a feel for what's going on around and <clears throat> kind of which area is getting the brunt of it. So I think that'd be a, a yeah, good but, idea for, <laughs> for, for people to know, too, right, for residents to be able to look and see. An excellent idea that comes to mind. We do have a map that was created each year, um, the number of... It, well, it, it accomplishes two things. The number of teardown rebuilds in each year, and then it's, um, it shows their location. So we have created a map that shows that. I think it goes back 10 years. Okay. And it's pretty well scattered throughout the city, but you can get an idea of um, what areas in Edina are, are hot at the moment. But yeah. that's a good idea. We can get that posted. You know, just kind of, you know it's never going to be completely up to date, but at least as current as it can be. Because some of these projects go on for six eight months it seems or, lo or longer mm -hmm. in some cases so they don't drop off that quickly actually thank you thank Commissioner you. Potts uh, Cindy thank you it was interesting to see that the topics by percent um, I have a, a similar question in terms of percentages of your time can you give us an idea of how much time you spend working with builders versus residents versus actually engaging as a mediator in the two together and maybe a sense of, of over the phone or in the field sure it really varies on the day and the and the issue um, a lot of times I do have to do some research when a call will come in I'll have to pull the file and see what we have on hand for information um, then I would visit the site and and talk to the builder from there if need be so it, it really does depend on each situation and in in my presentation too I really focused on the calls that I get what I didn't discuss is that I do spend a fair amount of time being proactive driving through the communities and looking for issues before I get a phone call in that case I'm dealing a lot more with builders like I said I'm out on the site saying this is what I see needs to be addressed and are, are your reports accessible to people if they're curious to see the follow-up? Or I know you take a lot of photos on site, for instance. Yeah, I have everything right now is in, on paper form, um, and eventually will be as as I find time. I'm hoping this winter mm -hmm. to get everything in put into spreadsheets and things. But yes, if people wanted information on how I remedy an, an issue, they're more than welcome to that. Sure. And then. Um, <coughs> on the, the topic of, of damage to adjacent sites, you had a, a 3% noted. To follow up on that, what, what role does the city actually play in getting involved? Are there timelines Mostly there set for remedies? Mostly again, or? just a mediator. Um, if there's an issue with a sprinkler head, for instance, that maybe got hit, I've contacted the builder and... Sometimes they'll meet on site, and sometimes they'll say, just have them send me the bill. So I work to try to remedy the issue because a lot of residents don't want to be, they don't want to make the call, and so it's easier for them to call me 
and I'm more than happy to try and find a solution to that. As far as the city fixing the issue, that's about where it would end. And do, do you ever actually, have you sat down at a table with a builder and a resident who's got I've an issue? I've stood out in the field many times with both parties. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Carr. City, uh, you're in a rather unique position because you're on the ground and you're seeing the practical application and enforcement of the ordinances. Um, one thing that would be very useful to us as a planning commission um, is if you could give feedback to Carrie. If you see that certain ordinances are too strict and they're simply not working, or if the ordinances aren't strict enough or there's something we've missed, if you could give feedback to Carrie and he can bring that back to us, I think that'll be helpful in us fine tuning the ordinances in this area. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Commissioner Forrest. I have a few questions. Um, just for clarification now, do you work in projects that have to do with remodels as well as whole house teardowns or just? <laughs> Technically, they don't fall under section 411, but I have had a number of calls regarding those items. And I feel that I, I'm, I try to be a one-stop shop. So if I get a call and I can figure out what to do, I'll do it if I need to get support from a different department, I'll do that as well. That sounds like a practical approach. Um, uh, regarding, you mentioned in your um, presentation confusion because some projects were grandfathered in. What types of things were grandfathered in? That was pertaining to the hours. So prior to the adoption of Section 411 on April 2nd, there were already houses under construction that were building based on the code 1040 hours. So the hours in section 411 are more restrictive and they weren't forced to move over into the new code hours. To me, that does not seem logical at all. I'm sorry. Um, then I was also wondering, you have uh, 300, I can't read it on here. Um, 396 calls regarding your pie chart. What, what's the time frame that that took place in? That was um, through the end of November. From when? July. And that doesn't t consider some emails that I received that were quick turnaround and I didn't print them out. So it's, it varies slightly. I, I, did have, I do receive a fair amount of emails as well. So it's, it's based on data that you're gathering, just logging as you're getting phone calls, trying to put them into a category, and then you've, you've tried to summarize that data? Correct. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I was wondering, when you talk about remedies and stuff, what's your just overall feeling as far as success goes? As, um, do you feel like you have the tools that you need for enforcement? Do you feel that people are satisfied with explanations? Uh, how, how's that working? In, the, in regards to parking, that's one area that we've actually, Carrie and I met with the police department on that. And we've talked about perhaps having me be able to do citations and parking tickets. It would alleviate a lot of phone calls to the police department and that a lot of times I'm already out on site. Um, so that would be very helpful. And as you saw, that's a big concern out there. So if I were to be out looking at a situation and somebody was, for example, parked um, in front of a fire hydrant or in the wrong location, I could take care of it versus now if I see something, I call the police myself and let them know to come out. So um, that, I believe, is in the works. That sounds like a good idea. Does, We've asked the city attorney to draft up ordinance that gives Cindy the authority to do that. So early 2014, that should be in place. That sounds practical because it's, I mean, each construction site is unique and the issues that are being faced are unique, so it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, neighborhood meetings between builders and, and uh, residents, how, how, what percentage do you think are actually doing that and how often are you involved in those meetings? 
they're required to do the neighborhood meeting. Um, in talking to builders, it's, it tends to be a fairly low turnout. If people aren't able to attend, they are most of the time, from what I've heard, they're open to phone calls to answer the questions. I've had people call and say they don't want them during the day. I've had people call and say it doesn't work when they're at night because my kids have activities. So, so we don't we don't enforce what what when and where they hold the meeting, and I don't think we need to change that because we're again that's going to be something that we're not going to be able to make everybody happy on. So if it's during the day and somebody isn't able to attend. Builders are receptive to getting those phone calls and answering questions that they have or meeting them separately. And one last thing, there was something I think it was in the Sun Current about a, a site where the radio was playing and so they sent the health department out to measure decibel levels versus, to me that does not seem logical when you've got perhaps blasting next to your infant's room a radio going, well it may be, you know, tolerable at freeway level noise but it's, um, I mean, there's what kind of enforcement do you have for something like that? I mean, they, somebody could be blasting an objectionable radio station, too much rap, too much talk radio, whatever, all day long from 7 a.m. to 5 or 6 or whatever. So what, I mean, how can we better, I mean, how can that be addressed in our community so the neighbors consider, I mean, the builders consider that they have to be good neighbors as well? In that instance, the the radio wasn't, what I would consider blasting um, by any means. And I went out with the health department. That was early on when I had started, just to get an understanding of what they do and how they monitor noise. Um, I have had very few of those instances. And if, if I do, I go out and ask them to turn the radio down or off. It hasn't, that's been a pretty small issue. I mean, it makes sense with, with equipment noises and things like that, but I think we also have a state nuisance law as well for, for things that are disturbing to people's enjoyment of their property. So that's why I was wondering is, if this is much of a problem or not or it just happened to hit the paper that time. So, Cindy, one of the topics that's been um, near and dear to our hearts here at the Planning Commission recently has been drainage. We've spent a lot of time trying to in our um, review of the of kind of residential redevelopment issues trying to um, address concerns that we heard from folks about drainage and especially in the context of a new structure going in um, on a smaller lot and how that impacts drainage and affects the neighboring properties i saw on the chart that you put up that it was i think eight percent of the calls you were getting were about drainage and then there were some about property damage which maybe kind of overlap a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about how, what is within your kind of um, scope with respect to drainage and then to the extent things are not within your scope, how do you handle those? So maybe even walking us through an example or two that you might have encountered that, to help us understand how we're really whether what we've been changing is actually working out there to, to address drainage issues. Sure. In drainage <laughs> questions, one example would be um, somebody calling with a general concern because the footprint is larger and they're concerned about impervious surface coverage. And maybe they also um, notice that the grades have been raised. This portion of the building permit pro review reviewal process is handled with the engineering department and I work closely with them once I get a call like that first I'll pull the, the file and see what kind of surveys we have on hand but I also contact the engineering department and talk with them about the review process that they had and what they saw because I want to get the, I want to get their take on it, on how they approve the permit. Um, and at least, it, what's your understanding of what their responsibility is before the permit goes out? What engineering's right. responsibility is? They need to um, review the stormwater and drainage plan that is now required with the application, and that has to be signed off by an engineer. 
that's new and that puts more um, liability on the builder to make sure that the the drainage is working and um, so the engineering department reviews those plans for approval so they do a, a desk review to look at the plans check the calculations make sure that what the engineer is representing as the plan will work to accomplish compliance with the code is there is there anybody is it you or anyone else who then you know how do we ensure that that's actually the way it gets graded or built in the field that it's consistent with the um, with the plan that gets submitted and approved by the engineering department or is that what you're seeing sometimes when you go out there well the there's a final as built that gets approved when the project is complete and that is then checked back onto the building plan so they review what was actually built and is that in comparison how is that compared to what was approved and so when you say as built again for folks who may not be familiar with that term that is a that is a certified survey that's done that will do the contours and show what the new um, topography is on the site after all the building is completed correct okay and then the the engineer will do another review of that to make sure it lines up with the original plan that was approved yes okay and do you encounter any of that as you're going out and you get these drainage complaints mm -hmm. you know it sounds like you take a look to see what the city engineer has done when you go out to the site then are you looking at what the consequence is or what you know if someone's calling to complain are they showing you something about where the water's going or how how does that work yeah I will typically meet the resident on their property and they can point out the concerns so that way I can bring the information back to engineering or somebody will somebody from engineering will join me as well uh, Commissioner Platter and then Commissioner Potts. Just a quick follow on that. So, who signs off on the certified as belts coming, or who, does anyone certify the as belts coming in? The engineer, an engineer, a certified engineer would need so the, to sign the off. So, the same person that, in theory, designed it also has a sign off at the end of it? Correct. Okay. But the, the as built isn't done by the engineer, it's done by a surveyor, I assume. And then a licensed engineer yeah so the the plan oh, that's it will. Submitted so to they'll you. sign off on what the surveyor does the licensed engineer will yes okay sorry to interrupt no I just that's what I was getting at so it's I, I wasn't speaking about the internal pieces this was, so the plan comes in signed by an engineer the as-built plan also comes in signed by that well survey done but by that licensed engineer correct correct okay thank you Mr. Potts. Um, on the same topic, Cindy, you mentioned a, a, a drainage policy draft being in place or a process that's at about 80%. And do you or Carrie know what the schedule is for completing that? I do not. Do you know, Carrie? I, we don't. It, it is something they've been working on for quite some time. It's a rather um, large endeavor. <laughs> But for our purposes here with that, it's the, um, that rate and volume control, having a policy in place. And this is something that we've talked about. Where does that go? Maybe it becomes part of 411 um, in terms of no increase in rate and volume going on to neighboring properties. So mm -hmm. it gives us a little bit more of a, a, a better review tool for engineering as they review those plans sure and Cindy are you are you giving this report to council as well or is this just a report for Planning Commission I have the work session coming up with mm -hmm. them okay because I guess I I would say I think that drainage policy is is very important to to deal with and I guess I don't know if if council is is watching this session I'd like to take the opportunity to strongly encourage that the that report be speeded to completion I think Carrie as you you know wonder where where it should live I think it spans across several departments and rightfully so and has impacts you know well beyond an individual property making change and in fact um, we heard a lot from residents when we did the the new policy work about concerns with larger homes 
being built than the previous one on a lot. And we've got this mechanism that you review at issuance of permit called lot coverage. And, and that mechanism is, is much more about controlling the size of a new structure than it is about impervious surface. And it's impervious surface, which really impacts drainage. And I think um, as, as I've had experiences adjacent to my own property, I've seen, uh, looked into the, the effect of this beyond the, the property at hand and in fact on city stormwater systems. And I just think it's something that, that needs some hard, hard attention and quick attention and should not be dragged out at yeah, all. That, that, that's an excellent point. Maybe we try to combine those two. Um, we do have a date that was set, actually, a change even from what we thought yesterday. But the work session has been scheduled for February 3rd with the City Council. Commissioner Fisher. I'm just curious, um, Carrie, does the Planning Commission, would we ever weigh in on anything in Section 411? In other words, when, when changes to the ordinance, this portion of the ordinance are being considered, who, what commission, committee, whatever would review that? I was just kind of wondering. Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's not, it's not, it's not 850, which under state statute says you have to, but this whole idea kind of originated here with the planning commission, so it would make sense that, that we would bring any changes. It just, it just feels body. like you know, on the other end, you know, we're, we're dealing with variance requests, which, this is where these kind of things sort of impact. Our residents who are we going to are we going to approve a variance and not approve a variance and I think on the policy side of that it seems like we should have some um, input on them just a thought and then as long as I've got the mic I would just say that um, and, and Cindy this isn't your decision you know but from a policy perspective I, I'm puzzled why we would grandfather hours of construction I can see you grandfather something that would be change the way a building's constructed or you know if they're halfway through it but if if it's too early to be on a site on block a then it's too early to be on a site in block b and and i wouldn't think that would impact the contractor so much just just an opinion probably too late to change it but yeah it's not so much a grandfathering but 411 has different hours of operation for construction than 1040 the regular ordinance so any building project that's going on that's not subject to 411 has different hours. Um, the council is aware of that, and we've talked about it, um, whether we match those two up. Um, but as of right now, they're not matched up. It feels like we're just making it more difficult for people who are out, like Cindy who are out there trying to <laughs> make a, a confusing thing less confusing. This isn't helping. But. Commissioner Platter. I think it's gone through, but I just want to echo Commissioner Potts comments on the drainage. As we went through, um, listen to residents' concerns, it, it, was a, it was a huge one. It didn't come up all the time, but it seemed like something that causes the most damage of any of these things overall. I mean, it could really impact what's happening with your, your lot and how you live if you have water all of a sudden coming in everywhere. So I would just echo the concern that that gets done sooner than later. And, you know, last year we went through this and we, we really got the uh, 411 pushed through pretty quickly once we got some momentum on that. So I would, <coughs> I would hope the same thing could be done on that. And if there's anything else out there that should be addressed that you know, could make a difference right away, we should push on that as best we can. Mr. Chair. Mr. Potts. Just one final question. <laughs> two, two parts. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, you, uh, what, which are you part of the planning department in this job description? You talk about working across different departments and where 411 lives. Yes, I'm technically. I'm technically in the planning department. Okay. And so, who assesses if one full-time position is enough, or do you do you have enough resources to? deal with the, the workload, the number of calls, the number of projects that are going on? If we wanted to be more proactive, there would definitely be an opportunity to, for me to have assistance um, because a lot of times I am in the office researching and gathering information and, and taking phone calls and working with the other departments. So I'm hoping to, once I get some of these policies in play, to be able to be out more 
Um, but it it's just depends on the flow of the calls coming in. So it, it sounds like you're saying there are times when you could use more, more resources or more time. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Forrest. As a follow-up, do you ever have <coughs> other departments come to you and say, you know, I was out on this site and it looks like, you know, they're parking this way or they've got debris there or whatever, and they, do they ever come to you and say, give you a heads up so that you can investigate further? Yeah, the inspectors do do that a fair amount. We communicate very well. And sometimes even the assessors, when they're out, they'll see something and give me a heads up. And I just want to reiterate what... Um, uh, Commissioner Fisher said about I think it's just really strange to have these different hours different rules whether it, it could be a major remodel on a on a very narrow street or a tear down on a big street and they're going by the same rules and nobody knows what the rules are so I second that as far as let's bring some consistency to this this is, and and also then that gives if somebody knows that they can call you or they know a friend called you about a tear down situation a construction situation in their neighborhood and they've got a major remodel next door, so they call you, then they don't get shunted off to somebody else, too. So, um, Part of the issue with that is, and the, the reason for the differing hours, is right now the, with the differing, it allows um, a homeowner to build a deck in their backyard on the weekend, whereas building a new home, you're, you, can't, you can't work toward that big project on a Sunday. So in a way, it's, it's to protect those with smaller projects. And so that's the intent of, of having the differing hours. And that makes sense, but why should there be that kind of an imposition? Because I'm running a generator, and I'm a homeowner, homeowner, owner, homeowner building a deck, so I can you know, have my friend's pickup truck parked there all day long or all weekend long. I mean, why should there be that much discrepancy anyway? It seems like there should be a rational approach you know, around the clock and no matter, you know, that applies evenly to everybody. Um, and, or at least, I mean, you're going to run into those problems, I think, that you get more calls on when you have larger crews. So, and that could be a major remodel or it could be a teardown, but it's not likely to be necessarily a construction of a deck in the backyard on the weekends. So, I don't know, I just, it just seems confusing and illogical to me. Um, Cindy, back on another topic, you, um, your data kind of was picked up from phone calls and you indicated that you get some emails as well. Do you, do you have kind of a closeout process then? So when a complaint comes in, is there a, are you responsible for following it until it's resolved? And does that continue even if it goes off to another department? Do you keep checking on it or is it out of your... Is it off your desk once it's in somebody else's hands? Most of the time, I want to make sure that it's closed out personally. There's been a few instances where I've gotten a call that's not related to my 411 code, and it might be a health issue or it might be something that the building official needs to look at. I would say that's been less than a dozen times. Otherwise, I want to make sure that I have my notes that it's taken care of. Well, I, I think that's, um, you know, I think that's a critical piece of this. We have, there, for a lot of good reasons, we have different departments that have different expertise and have different focus. But I think one of the things you can bring real value on is being the glue between those, because it's really easy <clears throat> and understandable that when it goes from Department A to Department B, the person in Department A says, well, I'm no longer, it's not, in my scope, I'm, I'm not going to follow it. It goes to Department B, and then, you know, pretty soon it's not, it's lost in the shuffle. And so I think it's really important to have somebody who's kind of chasing it throughout the process and is co helping coordinate between various departments so we don't have a kind of sea of silos where, uh, where the problem isn't getting solved. So I'd encourage you to keep doing that to the extent I'm sure you have um, more work than you're able to do, but um, from my own perspective, I think that's a really high priority to be the person who kind of is is uh, keeping track of making sure that the that the issues are getting resolved and the people who've made complaints are at least hearing back from somebody so that they understand what's being done to try and address it. 
Commissioner Carr. Well, first of all, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, you did an ex excellent job in your presentation here, and uh, you're doing a lot of good work. And I'm just wondering if it's been communicated to the public, the type of work you're doing and the transparency. So, for example, that chart you showed, the types of complaints that are coming in, some of your uh, steps that you're taking, the signage, things of that nature. I don't know if you've considered communicating that to the public in some of the uh, newspapers or the, the current, but again, I think um, this is of interest to a lot of residents, so you might consider some communication. But thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, I add my thanks to the others, um, Cindy, for taking the time to come and visit with us. We appreciate the work that you're doing and um, hope, um, you know, as some people have said, that we will stay in communication. And if there are things you see out there that are not, as a practical matter, working well, you know, make sure to pass those along to Carrie so that we can address those. Uh, we, we make our best efforts to, uh, to try to solve the problems, but if, uh, if the solution we come up with isn't, isn't providing a practical solution out there in the real world, we'd like to know about it. Thank you. All right, so the next item up on the agenda is um, sketch plan for Pentagon Office Park. Feels like deja vu all over again. <laughs> Looks like the team is gathering in the hallway. They are here, and I believe they'll have a PowerPoint to, to load up, but. I'll go ahead and want to introduce it. Introduce Carrie. it. Welcome, gentlemen. It was all. Yeah, didn't see anyone. <clears throat> so I'll I'll kick off the sketch plan here. This is a site you're all familiar with. It's the Pentagon Park, located south of the Fred Richards Golf Course. Two areas, essentially north of 77th, the office portion of the development here, then the Pentagon Tower site, and the project area also includes the Burgundy Place, located here, and the Walsh Title Building. The site's about 43 acres in size, just a hair over 43 acres. <clears throat> Back in 2008, the city rezoned this entire site to a mixed development district, and there was an overall development plan that was approved. That's uh, shown on the screen here. And as you, many of you probably recall, it was a mixed development site, uh, about 1.9 million square feet, that was to be divided equally amongst residential and non-residential. So the residential portion was the area north of 77, south of the golf course here. That was to be senior housing, uh, with some retail uh, mixed within. Then there was uh, two office towers with attached parking located on the Pentagon Tower site. And there was a hotel that actually received final approval but was never built in this location here. Then the Burgundy Place apartments with the retail below is located here. And then the Walsh Title site. There was also an AUAR that was done uh, back in 2008 and updated most recently this past summer. There were four development scenarios within that AUAR. Um, the one on the screen here, alternative one, was based on existing zoning and it outlined the square footage that would be allowed. Alternative two was the plan that we just saw on the screen that, uh, that highlighted a mixture of non-residential and residential. Alternative three is now closer to what the applicant is proposing here with um, not as much housing anticipated but more in the non-residential, uh, primarily office. This scenario three contemplated just on this Pentagon site about two and a half million square feet of non-residential space. What's proposed here is just under 1.8. So the density that's contemplated here is a little bit less than what this, this uh, scenario three had contemplated. Scenario four was the maximum residential alternative. So I won't go into the detail of the two alternatives that are presented here. The applicant can walk you through that. Again, this is a, um, 
somewhat familiar uh, to the Planning Commission as we reviewed this about a month or so ago. So the, the two alternatives as far as the land use is concerned is generally similar uh, with office buildings and there is a contemplation for a hotel in that same site where the hotel was contemplated before. The difference between the two, that, that first plan um, contemplates Fred Richards staying as is with the golf course and then the regional trail that would come in uh, on the south side of the golf course. And the second alternative contemplates a potential repurposing of, of Fred Richards. Doesn't, um, um, there's no anticipated um, specific use that's proposed here. Just to su a suggestion of providing a, a little bit better integration into the development, into that public space. Uh, most significant is the connection of that site through the Walsh Title site, um, where the previous plan, uh, it's much more separated between the two. And again, the developer will, applicant will walk through that a little, in a little more detail. They've also provided this height overlay. Um, they're suggesting four stories adjacent to the golf course, five stories adjacent to 77th in the orange area. The green indicates uh, 12 stories, which is what the comprehensive plan calls for for that site. The hotel potentially could be over 12 stories. Anything over 12 would require a comprehensive plan uh, amendment. Um, <clears throat> and the five story would, um, would contemplate a rezoning as four stories is the maximum on that site. The comprehensive plan, interestingly, does call for 12 stories on that size, on that side, but the zoning ordinance maximum is four stories. So just to walk you through a little bit of comparison um, under the existing zoning of the MDD-6 and the PUD, um, differences, uh, as I pointed out before, the five stories where the existing zoning is four stories on the north side of 77, potentially over 12 stories um, on the tower site. And then the, really the most significant change is the breakdown of the land uses where <clears throat> um, there's not as much housing anticipated here. In fact, as proposed this evening, um, it's suggested for about 1.8 million square feet of non-residential, primarily office space. Uh, within our PUD ordinance, as highlighted in the, in the review memo, the city can require residential uses here as part of this project. As this site is guided office residential, we can um, require that type of use within the zoning. The applicant is open to that and would like to have that residential um, potential open as part of any ordinance amendment to PUD. Uh, just not shown specifically on the plans as they move forward, but would like to reserve that potential in the future. So the process here, the goal is the sketch plan here before the Planning Commission this evening. This will go to the City Council, their first meeting in January, January 7th for sketch plan. They'll then use uh, January to prepare plans to submit a um, preliminary rezoning request to planned unit development and that would be reviewed by the Planning Commission at your February meeting, probably the second meeting in February. <clears throat> And from there, it would go to the city council in March. So the goal of the applicant here is to obtain at least preliminary approval by the end of March. And then the, the second step would be final rezoning, where we would draft the ordinance specific for the whole site. <clears throat> and they would likely be uh, looking for a final, uh, final site plan for at least phase one, potentially that tower site. So with that, um, I can stand for questions, or the developer is here and um, could present their uh, project in a little bit more detail. Carrie, just to bring us up to date, um, this was here before us as a sketch plan or a preliminary sketch plan or a quasi-sketch plan or some kind of sketch plan previously. Can you um, give us the update on where it went from here and the path that it took then to come back here? Yeah, they did then go to the city council um, and had that same type of format, kind of a pre-sketch plan discussion. And the result of those meetings, both w with you and the city council, is um, where we're at this evening. OK. Other questions for Mr. Teague? Commissioner Potts. Yeah, Carrie, in the 2008 um, mixed-use version, was any traffic study done when it was half residential, half commercial? Yes, it was done as part of the 
AUAR. And so there are certain, um, at certain thresholds for the amount of density, there are some improvements that would need to be made to the roadways. Now as part of this, um, that, that next step, there, we would have to examine the traffic and determine how that would, uh, in comparison to the AUAR, it doesn't have to be as in-depth because it's already been looked at, but um, we will have, have a, a traffic consultant on board as part of that first phase. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Teague? All right, thank you, Carrie. Yep. Have a PowerPoint that we need to. Welcome back. Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Scott Tankoff. Um, it does kind of seem like only yesterday that we were back here. So, a little less than a month. So, as Carrie mentioned today, uh, it mentioned already, tonight we're here for to go over the sketch film review for Pentagon Park <coughs> as a PUD. And since we were last year, we've had several meetings with staff to go over what we think of the of the plan itself and make some additional modifications. And I feel we both have jointly determined that this is best served as a PUD. So that's why we want to bring this forward. The PUD, why it makes sense, I have a few points I'd like to just talk about. It's going to allow for the commercial density, potentially of a million nine square feet, which is what we need for the project. And without it, without the PUD, we would really end up only merely stabilizing the existing buildings that are there. And we have stabilized some of them, but it, it would never be the type of project that it has the potential to be. Uh, its current zoning of the MDD6 has a similar density, but its density, again, is split between residential and commercial. And the PUD would, again, allow for certain flexibilities and uses that are going to be beneficial for both the city, both for the community, as well as for us, which we think is, again, is very important. Um, as we're going to discuss in a moment, uh, it's, going to, it's going to result in several unique and desired improvements and amenities at the site. And to compare it with the site of what it currently is, the site doesn't enjoy many of those amenities today, such as you know any sort of quality of stormwater management, um, efficiency in parking, uh, any real green initiatives that have been employed, because candidly, the site is very much as it was back in the 60s when it was constructed. So time, in a sense, has passed it by. Um, again, we're also looking that mixed uses, including residential, would be allowed. And I think from the standpoint of residential, it's, again, another comment and another suggestion that we heard here. Um, we've heard a lot of different things, and I think our, our intention has been to be good listeners and really to take in the, the comments and the insight that people have had that have been not just on the Planning Commission but involved with the City Council and staff because you've been here longer than we have. You've been around Edina in a much larger capacity than we have, and I think our intention has been to be good listeners do good intake and to keep a good running list of good possible alternatives. So when it comes to residential, um, we don't know that the time has come now for that to be viable. There are some reasons why we think its viability are severely challenged. But we also know as hopefully intelligent developers and long-sighted people that things change and that there could be the potential at some point that housing or some form of housing is the right use there. But I also would want to point out that right now, there aren't a lot of good amenities that are in sight. There's not good infrastructure in sight, and it may be a very nice location if you're traveling in a single occupant vehicle on the freeway system. I think part of what we're all trying to do is get off the dependency of that system as best we can. So uh, again, you know, part of what we're looking for is a good long-term approach. Um, we also think with uh, this project being a multi-phased approach, and given its size, given its sheer mass, the only way to make this work, again, is a PUD process. So uh, we think this is a, a good approach and the right approach, thus we want to continue with it. Um, in order to commence with the project, uh, specifically the tower site, though, we are going to need certain density and we are going to need uh, to, to approach height and other components. And that's why we've been looking at this project and thinking about how do we do this in a, in, in, within your PUD ordinance. And 
The ordinance requires and provides for a preliminary as well as a final. It's really a two-step process. And the preliminary PUD being approved before the 31st of March of 2014, it's a timing that will work for us. It's also a timing that we believe will work for the city process for a proper vetting of the process through your public process. So again, timing is tight. We have some things that we can't control at the site, but we feel that getting that preliminary review gets us into a place that we have something that finally is tangible. Um, we're bringing forward two plans, and you're going to see those plans uh, in more detail in a moment. Uh, Tom Whitlock and Bob Close are going to give a brief explanation of what has changed between the site plans that we, or the preliminary plans that we showed you about a month ago and today. And I think it's important to point, that, point out that we, we would have not come forward with two plans, but there is a process in place that's uh, taking place right now in looking at the golf course where what should the golf course be in the future? What is the use of that land? And that's something that the city is involved in studying. So as a, a developer trying to make our 42 acres functional at this point, we have to move forward with something that's viable. And so what we've tried to do is come up with a plan that allows for us being, in a sense, I guess, independent, which is not our preference. We would prefer to not, we would prefer to integrate with our, with our neighbor. We would prefer to find the best stormwater management practices, the best access, the best integration with Nine Mile Creek, uh, just the best uses that really turn this into a marvelous public and private space. And I think that, again, when, when I think about Centennial Lakes, when I think about Normandale Lakes, two marvelous projects that are one in your community, one adjacent to your community, they both have really, really excellent public and private amenities within their space. They have very good architecture. They're timeless. They've been well cared for also. And right now, Pentagon Park does not have any good public-private amenity to it. It's without that. So we would prefer that plan. We would prefer something very much like that plan, but that may not be possible. We don't have ultimately the control or the say over that. And so we have to come up with something that is viable. And thus that is the first option, which is it's a self-sufficient option. It still provides quite a bit of the same amenities, but we may not be able to take advantage of the stormwater combination between the Richards property and our property, not knowing Richards may not change. So we'll have to be self-sufficient with that. And we'll also have to exceed your expectations of what your code requires, which we're prepared to do when it comes to stormwater management and green space. Um, for tonight and for the near-term future, really through the 31st of March, you're going to notice something that may be a little bit different than some other PUDs that have been brought forward, but it's consistent with your ordinance. It's also consistent with a lot of other municipalities. You're not going to see a lot of architectural detail. In fact, you're not really going to see any architectural detail because it is a two-step PUD, and as an example, if we go forward uh, with this, if we get the preliminary uh, PUD approval, uh, we would be back in at a later date. It could be within a few months. It could be within a little bit later into 2014. And we'd be hopefully back in with a finalized PUD process that's going to get into quite a bit of detail, a lot of architectural detail, um, a lot of things that uh, have been looked at and have been scrutinized not only by this commission but also by council members and others. And candidly, we welcome that. I mean, that, that's going to be a good thing because at that point, we've got a project that's not only viable, but it's a project that truly is moving forward. And I think that you'll hear this again from Tom and from Bob, but great architecture in my opinion, is going to be the, it's really going to be the result of great land use. And our approach here has been to come up with really great land use, good land use principles that fold in what the community has been looking for, what all of you have been talking about, which again are green initiatives, stormwater management, um, being a little bit more intelligent with your parking instead of just having a big gray surface parking lot, um, really looking for the best things that we can, that we can bring forward. So. Again, that, that's our desire and that's our focus with this. So I think that as we, we need to obtain that final, the final PUD in each and every phase, you're going to have the opportunity, again, to review and scrutinize those plans. And again, we look forward to that. Um, and again, the, uh, the approach of that would be it has to be consistent with the preliminary PUD that would have been approved. Uh, that's going to occur at each and every phase of the development. <coughs> Um, in a moment, again, you'll hear from Bob and Tom. They're going to walk you through some of the changes that we have. Some of it will look familiar. Some of it is a little bit different. 
I think their presentation will highlight why our proposed redevelopment of Pentagon Park really is a, a great candidate. It is the perfect candidate for PUD, for, again, for several reasons, again, and these reasons include sustainable design, uh, pedestrian-oriented design, high-quality landscaping, uh, high-quality lighting, and a design that's going to be sensitive and integrate with Fred Richards' property, whatever that property use will end up ultimately being. Um, high-quality stormwater management that is not going to be just a necessity, but it is intended to be an amenity, something that people want to congregate around. Improvements and efficiencies of public streets actually trying to beautify a public street such as 76, or excuse me, 77th, and green space in excess of code compliance. Um, we really believe that the preliminary uh, approval will provide adequate protection for both parties, both for the, for the municipality, for the city, as well as for us. Um, if we have certainty on density, land use, and height, the city is going to have certain commitments from us, and the requirements in the master development plans and the resolution of approving the uh, preliminary uh, PUD approval. So, again, we're, we're excited to be here a little bit sooner than we thought we might be here, but. Uh, Again, thank you and would welcome any questions uh, if there aren't any or when we get through the questions, like turn over to, to Bob and to Tom. Thank you, Mr. Tankanoff. Any questions at this point for Mr. Tankanoff? We can certainly have a lot of discussion once we get through your entire presentation. Commissioner Fisher. Okay, maybe I'm just really slow tonight, but I'm, I'm still missing, maybe I didn't hear it or read it, but we saw a sketch plan review a month ago Carrie, maybe maybe you can help me with this. Um, are, or you said you, you're looking at a March deadline for preliminary PUD review. What what's driving that, um, Mr. Fisher? What we have is we have a couple things that are ongoing. One, we have a blight study that has a shelf life to it, and that blight study was completed uh, roughly October 1st. So, uh, from a six month standpoint, we felt we needed to complete our approach from the standpoint of our project within that six-month period of the preliminary reviews. Um, that's a component of the tax increment financing, which is a, a piece of this project that is following a little bit after right now the sketch plan review. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be again talking with staff about that. So that's one of the things that's out there. We have a couple of tenants that are in the tower over at the, um, at the tower site, and those tenants need to be noticed, and they will need to be told that we are going to relocate them. We have until basically April to do that. If we do not make that notice, we cannot relocate them. So this is a, a I, we negotiated the best we could. These were tenants that were in existence for the most part when we purchased the property uh, from the former lender that took it back. And we negotiated as best we could. If we could have, we would have had a longer time frame, more of a rolling time frame. We couldn't do it. It was a couple of the businesses were such that they needed certainty of when they would be relocated. And candidly, if we don't relocate them, we need to leave them. Okay, I, and so that that helps, um, Carrie. When when like so, last time you were here, you weren't. It wasn't uh, definitive that you're going to use PUD, correct? So that's different. I think. I, I think we we felt you, it was on we, the we, table. We felt very strongly that PUD was the right approach to this, but we had not conclusive, it was not conclusive, right. and there were several subsequent conversations not, and meetings with staff to go over it. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think it's the right thing to do, so I don't have a problem with that, but, but Carrie, is it, when, when a developer is proposing PUD, then sketch plan review is a requirement, correct? Or is it, it not? Yeah, it's, it's never a... Or is it always a, voluntary? It's, it's, it's I can't even remember my own rules. Right. Okay, so... Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of so there wasn't a requirement to come back for sketch plan review. It's, it was more as, as part of the process, correct? Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that we still kind of maintain the idea of sketch plan review. Is there's nothing binding about this? It's just opinions to help you craft the right proposal. Okay. Right. Thanks. And, and I guess I would say on the flip side of that, we appreciate your flexibility with this tool. Again, the purpose of sketch plan is for us to give you ideas before you're so cemented in and you've spent so much money on developing a plan that it becomes very difficult for you to change directions. So while it's not binding, I, I appreciate that you've come back for a second kind of informal conversation. Yeah, and I don't want to in any way suggest, I'm not being negative about it. I'm just trying to get the context and make sure I'm understanding if there's something driving 
that yeah, schedule. So it it might be our better. first kind of double sketch plan. It totally is our first <laughs> double sketch plan. I'm like, wow. Well, I think we had another one, but it was two different projects yeah, that, on the same one. The that project, they changed the big project. Time. Okay. Okay. Um, same project. I, I think that the the approach on this is that we got good intake before. I think we want to be sure that we're following all the protocols for this project to start with. We want to be sure that it's correct. We want to be sure it's vetted. Um, it's a lot of times what I've experienced is that in, in a community process, sometimes people don't feel like it's inclusive. They don't feel like they've heard about it. They don't feel like they've known what's going on. Uh, we, that's part of why we're, it's a piece of why we're back here tonight. But more than that, it's why we've been talking with the neighbors. It's why we've been scheduling open houses. It's for that very reason, we don't want someone to feel like they weren't informed or didn't have something that they could say about it. So, intake is good. Well, very good. I think that does it for now. We can hear from um, Mr. Close and Mr. Whitlock. Welcome back, gentlemen. So I think if you're not going to use the side podium, you have to use that hand microphone. All right. There you go. Right. You can walk around in the crowd with all the people we have here tonight. <laughs> By the way, full disclosure, I, I may get a call. Um, I have it on mute. Well, we can all participate in it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm waiting for Bob and Steve. Let's see when they get here. It's a slow night tonight. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Yeah, indeed. Can I start this? Do you want me to start this? Either way. Uh, Okay, well, uh, in fact, the diagrams you will see tonight are very similar to what you saw last time, but um, we have been doing additional research into some of the issues that you brought up, having to do with parking and creative ways of managing parking, so we've been gathering that kind of information together. And as this process gets into greater detail, um, we will be able to have more specificity about how parking might be managed <laughs> Uh, on the site, both shared parking, but also within buildings, underneath buildings, uh, because you, you, Commissioner, you had a, a very good point about not wanting to see these things on the on the edge of sites. I uh, wanted to find a way to integrate parking more successfully with the project. Um, the diagram that is in front of you here basically shows the Pentagon Park property, but there is the addition of the Walsh property across 77th, so you can see that triangular site there. That's a critical piece of, of ground when it comes to the potential connection underneath 77th, which will tie the two halves of this project together. So we, we really believe that that's, that's a critical piece, and as you know, it, it, it does appear in one of the two diagram TIF diagrams. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Bob. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the other piece of property that, oh, that is too, yeah. soon to be added uh, is the parcel at the corner of Computer and Viking, Viking Drive, which is up in this uh, southeast corner of the tower site. So that's, that's new to this plan that we didn't have at the last. So that's this parcel right here. Okay. Just as a point of reference, where does where does Edina leave off and Bloomington begin on that map? That's a good question. It's um, been shifting over the years, it, I know. It, it's, uh, I believe this is Viking Drive, and it extends right here. All right. So this is the so you're right up against the border. Between okay. Edina and Bloomington. So this isn't a formal annexation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it looks like you have the yeah. Seagate parking lot, and Bloomington has the building. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the, um, the TIF diagrams that you saw before, these are essentially um, revisiting them with you. And um, the first one is the minimalist scheme, which essentially keeps everything on Pentagon Park's property, brings the regional trail right to that edge, does create a parkway that you see in the pink color along that edge so that there are, there's a potential for addresses for businesses there and also just a way to access those businesses uh, with a front door. Um, and then you see the green streets that are connecting back down to 77th. And again, this is, this is what you have seen before, but we wanted to revisit that with you. And, uh, and basically what you see in orange boxes, those are the parking decks, and that spurred the comment about 
trying to internalize them in a more creative and less visible way. And now I'm going to let you do the statistics on this. <laughs> Okay, uh, and, and this is just a TIF diagram. So uh, as I think Michael mentioned uh, at the last meeting, the concern about the ramps at the edge of, of 77th. Uh, so Mr. Woodlock, when you say it's a TIF diagram for people who might not be familiar, can you just give us a it, It's a way of putting of all of the potential uses on the site uh, and to understand how much of the property is going to be covered with building, with parking ramp, with roads, just to understand the overall infrastructure needed to support the development. As part of a larger analysis of a potential tax increment financing yes. funding of this portion, por partial funding anyway. Correct. Okay. Um, the other, so there's some things that are consistent uh, between the two diagrams, certainly improving 77th Street um, to a more pedestrian friendly uh, character currently it's five it's a five lane roadway two lanes in each direction with a center turn lane there is a sidewalk a narrow sidewalk I believe it's about four feet wide on the south side and there's no sidewalk on the north side although there are a number of transit stops uh, on both sides of the road um, and so uh, the the project has always envisioned in either scenario that 77th be improved to a much more pedestrian friendly experience adding uh, a center boulevard, allowing left-hand turn lanes uh, to access business on both sides of the street, uh, but create a much more uh, green and uh, slow traffic uh, a little. It does have an arterial uh, function to it, so that will not change. But then adding sidewalks and boulevards on both sides uh, of the street to facilitate pedestrian movement. Um, something new on this diagram that wasn't the la in the last diagram you saw is the addition of a small building, uh, roughly 20,000 gross square feet at the Walsh Title site, replacing the existing building in, in that location, uh, which would be accessed off of 77th, probably near the Burgundy Place uh, development. Um, and then, then, as you see on the tower site, uh, there are two office uh, buildings. Uh, one uh, totaling a total of about 500,000 gross square feet, and then the hotel site, which Scott uh, mentioned uh, and Carrie mentioned, which would be facing Highway 100, uh, and that is roughly uh, 375 to 425 room uh, hotel. Two parking ramps that would serve uh, that development, but also could be used by the community to access green space. Uh, whether it's here and in the other diagram, you'll see access across 77th. Uh, and then back on the north side, uh, again, uh, office uses primarily, uh, and each one of these cells is roughly about 300,000 gross square feet uh, with a parking ramp uh, to serve roughly an 800 stall parking ramp in each one of these locations to serve the office uses. Any questions about this diagram? Otherwise, it's pretty consistent with what you saw last time. I, I've got one um, brief one. In terms of the underpass, it seems like that could be part of this option just as much as the other. Is, is there something I'm missing? Well, one. the underpass, uh, the if I flip forward, forward, so the the larger scheme that shows the underpass here. Uh, I think certainly you could do it. I think the the uh, the challenge is that, you know, trying to get a, a building in there as well. In addition, I mean, the two diagrams are looking at a, more of a minimalist approach and more of the maximum approach in terms of um, how tax increment financing could help support various changes on the site but so that is one that you're right it could it could be adapted to this there 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 could be points in between these two bookends that you're seeing these sure. two diagrams. so you're just showing us the extremes exactly tonight yeah okay thank you uh, so the second option shows the larger vision uh, that uh, all shows all of the the new development happening within the existing property lines of the Pentagon Park uh, properties, 
Uh, it shows uh, a repurposed Fred Richards uh, with a parkway uh, along the south side of the property connecting the green streets and the development to the, the park uses um, at that location uh, with the road looping back towards 77th at this location at that green street. Um, all of the uses uh, and ramps, stormwater are all consistent with the first option. So it's the same level of development and density of development. Um, the change certainly is the extension of the parkway uh, over to 77th at this location at the tower site and the addition of the overpass, uh, which would allow stormwater and a connection to the regional trail to flow underneath 77th. And um, Commissioner Fisher, you did, you specifically mentioned the potential of linking the parkway further <laughs> over to Park Lawn across the north side of the site, and that's something that we, we, we heard loud and clear, um, particularly with Commissioner Schroeder's sketch that started to show how the Pentagon Park linkage could be so crucial to a broader idea for the southwest quadrant of the city. So it, it doesn't show yet on this diagram, um, but it's something that we're well aware of and, and we understand the, the rationale for that. Huh. Uh, there, there are no other differences between the schemes. Right, I mean the, build, the building, you still have a building at Walsh here, but it's reoriented to allow the, the connection to happen. and the heights, which Kerry already addressed, and here he is, right on cue. So the, uh, the height diagram basically, again, um, Kerry did show this to you earlier, but the notion that the north, north of 77th, the north half of the block would be no higher than four stories, south half of the block could go to five stories. Um, the Walsh Tidal site, we're thinking two, and then as you get south of 77th, this is where we begin to, to build the massing higher, where you can have 12 stories or more in the hotel site, and then the, um, the remainder of the site is 12, 12 up, as up well, 12. up to 12, right, for the office area as well. So that's, that is the height diagram that uh, has been developed to this point in time. Are there any questions about that? Commissioner Grable. Uh, when, when, when this was before the commission several years ago and they had that ugly red hotel <laughs> plan for that site, uh, there was much discussion by the neighbors to the north about the height of the, the current tower. And I just want to make it clear and get clarification uh, that building is, what, six stories high, six stories of office, but then there's that elevator thing or whatever that sticks up on top of it. So it's really m more almost equivalent to, what, an eight-story building maybe or a nine? Do you know for sure? I don't know for sure. Eight or nine. Eight or nine. There's uh, phone equipment, uh, cellular phone equipment that's up there and also... Uh, other mechanical equipment. I, I think eight or nine is a fair comparison at its top. Okay. I just want to make that clarification. Any other questions? Commissioner Carr. I don't know who, maybe this is directed to you, Carrie, but these are height restrictions that are part of the PUD? The height restrictions are um, in a couple of places. They're in okay. our zoning ordinance and in the comprehensive plan. Okay, so these high restrictions are currently in place. Correct. So if there was something for a mixed-use development where residential was contemplated, um, then would the applicants have to come back if they wanted to build something higher uh, within that north area for residential? Anything taller than four stories correct the five story would take an amendment to the zoning ordinance the zoning restriction on the north side of 77th is four stories okay 
I just wanted to understand how this related to the concept of possibly putting in residential in the future, which the height requirements might work, but they might not. Other questions? Commissioner Forrest. I'm not sure what we're, where we're at with this right now as far well, as- I was going to ask, is this kind of the end of the <laughs> yeah. presentation or um, should we kind yes, of launch into feedback. dialogue and discussion or you have more to share with us? No, it's, it was brief. Okay, was brief. that's good. All right. I have just a couple of comments when, whenever it's- required. Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Mr. Tankanoff? Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to make a, a, a couple of clarifications in the, from the presentation. Um, I think it was uh, Commissioner Potts had uh, asked a question about the, the tunnel connection or the bridge connection. And from my, from my perspective, in my opinion, the reason that we showed it in one and not the other had to do with, it has to do with what are we integrating to. And it really has to do with what will the future of Richard's land be? which I'm sure everybody has at least one opinion of what it could or should be, and that's going to be a community process and a leadership process that's going to be vetted out that we're very interested in seeing what happens, but it's not our decision, candidly, and it probably will not happen in a time frame that exactly follows what we need to do to get Pentagon Park to move out from three decades ago. So we have a plan that we think can accommodate either extreme. My comment would be, it's a lot of infrastructure if we're going to connect to something that's not meaningful. I think connecting just to the northerly land between the south and the north parcels is nice. I don't think it's enough. That, that's my opinion, and I'm open to everybody's opinion. But in, from my perspective, this is about if there's a, a community decision to do something different with that resource, and it should stay a community resource, public. How do we integrate so that we have people that can come from the south, and go to the northern land and be able to enjoy whatever in the world that use is, whatever that public use is. And candidly, that's worth the investment from my perspective of, ad of additional dollars and in infrastructure because that makes the south property a whole lot more intriguing to people that want to be there. Uh, people that are looking at today's work environment or today's recreational environment if they're in a hotel, they don't want to just walk around a street or a sidewalk. They want to go to a park. They want to go to somewhere they can recreate. They want to walk on a green street. They want to be able to go buy an ice cream cone or buy something that's local and be part of that fabric. And to me, that, that's the ultimate. And, and that's what I hope is going to happen here. But there are some decisions that we, there are some things we do not have control over. So I, I just wanted to address that because as much as we want to see it happen, it may not be feasible if it's just our private property to the north and the private property to the south. So I, I did want to address that. Um, so just to be clear, Mr. Tankoff, are you saying that option two does not work if the golf course remains? It certainly doesn't work as well because what are we integrating to and the golf course, from my perspective, would how would we be sharing stormwater management? Uh, would there be major improvements made to the golf course? How would the trail integrate with the golf course? Uh, a lot of unanswered questions, and I think that's why there's going to need to be some time for the city, for the community, to continue with its process. And we're taking an approach of thinking, okay, we have to have either alternative. We know we've got a timeline that's coming up on us. We better be, we have to be nimble enough to come up with a couple of alternatives, and that's why we've done it. Um, there's going to be time to integrate either one of these plans. That's why the PUD is such a marvelous tool in this case because we're going to be back on every phase of this development. And many of these phases, many of these infrastructures can be put in over time and, and linked together. And I think that's what's so nice about starting with land use instead of starting with architecture in a building. I'll bet 99 out of 100 people come in here and they talk about architecture. We're going to have that conversation with you. We're really only talking about land use, good land use policy right now. You know, what is the framework of eventually good architecture? So I think that that's where this really gets traction. Commissioner Fisher. I was just going to add, I mean, I, I get exactly what you're saying, and it makes perfect sense. The only, the only thing I would say is it's probably not whether it's a golf course or not, but if it's publicly, if it's a piece of property that has a fence between it and yours, that's really the defining factor. It could be a redesigned, re reimagined golf course that's integrated with a parkway that would then still serve the same purpose. So it's 
I'm not sure it's about golf or not golf. That is another discussion, and you don't want to get that mixed up in this discussion. But it's just that are you going to – I think earlier, the last time around, you had a, a really wonderful diagram that showed the integration of public and private use. And that's the question is, will it be integrated? If it is, underpass makes a lot of sense. If it isn't, it doesn't. And that's I think that's a great way to approach it. Commissioner Forrest. And one of my questions was, is it – possible when you start on this project to then still adapt to the second scenario if you needed to and that's you said that that could be a possibility as you go forward so that's nice to hear that there is that flexibility and I understand you need something concrete to to go forward at this point um, I guess when I looked at these pictures they are so sparse and that I looked at them and I'm going well I'll just put it in the industrial area then because it looks like you said this is to do with more land use rather than layout and all of that so I, I get that now but what got me thinking was with all of the improvements that you talk about doing on 77th Street that we have those pedestrian friendly changes which I think is wonderful I would I guess I would love to see the buildings that face 77th really um, interact with that street so that there are entrances there so that it's not just oh here's a nice sidewalk I can walk down but that there's a cafe down here and there's a bookstore there I would love to see small type um, boutique type businesses um, along there that I guess I'm thinking kind of like along the metro and in, in DC the stops that you go along along these major roads there's these little neighborhood nodes of, of shops and restaurants and things like that that the hotel as well as the local residents could enjoy and, and really maximize the use of that street. That's a good comment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Forrest. I just had a question. When you came up with these parking numbers, is that from the current recommendations? Or is where, the number of parking stalls required? The current zoning code. Okay, okay. Based on the, the uses that are described on the diagrams. Because I hope that as we go forward, we can be somewhat creative with that as well. And um, actually, uh, I think, yeah, and I just saw the motion, the, the ratio of those parking stalls we think are actually are going to drop. So we've been looking at how to reduce them because this is, again, going to be about a site about how we can integrate different transit policies with them. And there is there is no magic bullet at this point. We don't have, other than the mass transit that exists, we don't have any other mass transit. That may change in the future. So what we have to do is we have to be smart and we have to be integrated from the standpoint of we can't just have, a. as an example, we're not just looking to have a bike rack. We're not looking to have a single stall shower. We're looking to have things that integrate with how people really use a bike to commute as an example where some people may have a bike that's a few hundred dollars. Some people have a bike that's tens of thousands of dollars. Regardless, they want to put their bike in a secure and safe area, usually indoors. They want to have a maintenance a uh, stand that they can, uh, whether they need to change a tire, whether they need to do something different or work on alignment. So uh, those are all parts of the integration that need to happen. And candidly, uh, we are going to put some of those integration points into our currently stabilized product. And some of that product, again, toward the east side of, uh, on the north end of 77th, could stay for a little bit. So those are the things we need to do. But I think you're going to see the parking numbers come down a bit. And that is desirable for a whole lot of reasons. There's a lot of there's a lot of green reasons. There's a lot of good planning and best practices. There are some economic reasons as well. Commissioner Potts. A couple of thoughts. Um, I think the, the idea of, of increasing commercial density certainly on this site makes all the sense in the world. It's a, a place that, that could use it with the critical caveat that the traffic study work so I think it's going to be really important you know I, I asked Carrie if a traffic study had been done on the previous plan when it was half residential half commercial um, I think as part of the information we gather as we make this decision that's sh that should be brought up to date so we can compare if, if there's a discernible difference in traffic volumes between a, a site that's developed per the master plan or per the um, city plan that was done in 2008 compared to what you're proposing now because uh, I like I, I told you last time I think this site really is crying out for some residential now if if the demand isn't there then there, there's no point in building it but we do hear studies about uh, an increase in um, 
in the number of residents in the city and particularly uh, you know along the edge of that green space you've defined on the north side of the site that that would make a lot of sense and it would also be the thing that takes this from being a nice suburban office park to something really exciting and vital i think um you know you, you talk about green streets and that that's great um your green street images are all of residential settings so i guess think about that show us some of those how they'd apply if you're really proposing 100 percent commercial show us how how a green street looks and and talk about i think not only how that would be used but also try and flesh out some of these ideas about um, traffic traffic demand management you talk about reducing parking count i think you'd get support generally um, on that and mass transit but i think you need to convince us that it would um, you know that it would really be used because to um, as blighted as this site is and as much attention as it as it needs uh, I think to have innovative, uh, innovative traffic and parking use and innovative stormwater isn't really so innovative anymore. It's sort of the you know it's become the norm um, to do these things. So so I'm looking for a little bit more and and maybe this is the fact that um, you know you, you you guys decided to come in for another visit with us. So we're starting to look at this cl more and more closely, you know, without getting detail. And that's, that's part of the, the risk you take, I think. So you're um, saying you've seen it before, but it was them a month ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're not innovative yeah, anymore. Yeah. We saw this a month ago. <laughs> so, no, I like, sorry. I like it for what it is. <laughs> certainly. Um, <laughs> um, but still one, I, I don't quite understand where, where the housing is that, that was proposed in, in 2008. It just feels a little off um, without that. So, no, sorry, no specific questions, but just some sketch plan thoughts for you. I, I do want to address the, again, the question of housing because the way that we've been looking at the site, again, today, it's not viable, but we do think this is a long term, multiple phase development. In the discussions we've had with carrying with staff, uh, as, as well as the, the intake we took here and elsewhere. Housing may very well appear in two multiple phases. My personal opinion is that you're not going to see it in the first couple phases. Uh, my crystal ball gets a little fuzzy after that, and I think that's exactly why this should be included. We, we really don't not only know what the so-called market will bear, we don't really know what the infrastructure and all of what will support. So I think that's the real critical question is, can we provide for it? Absolutely. Uh, you're encouraging it. And I think if, if it's viable and if we can get it all to integrate, if it's got the right infrastructure, we're open to it. We're very, very open to it. So we really don't know what the uses will be. And we, we have some strong opinions about that it is primarily commercial. We do think that hotel, a high quality hotel with high quality design, you have a very high quality new hotel in your community right now. I don't envision a condominium component with this one. I, I think it's a pure hotel, but the numbers on that hotel of what it's done for the community, what it's done it, itself, and what it's done to revitalize things are, they stand on, they stand on their own, and there's totally demand for it. But I think the, the question of housing, we're gonna, we're gonna get to that. And that may be, it could be five, four, six years down the road. But I think that's the duration of many of the phases of this project anyway. Sure, and I think that, oh, just if I could follow up on that. Um, I, um, that, would be good, that would be good to see shown in these diagrams. I think your notion of, of developing that southwest quadrant first where the tallest buildings are makes perfect sense to me. You, know, you, you made it a point to state that the square footages you're showing us are exactly the same, yet there's what, you know, wildly different schemes here and I imagine that's part of the negotiation with the city about developing um, some of the amenity space in between it would be nice to also see how you could accommodate your performing needs with the amount of square foot of commercial space yet still reserve some space for housing almost like a proof of parking type concept in that world sure and I, and I think if we, we need to show some buildings on the site in, in these schematic plans in the drawings we've needed to show where some buildings can go the shape of the buildings their exact location i don't want to say it's we threw a dart at it these guys did a lot more than throw a dart at it but it it's very clear that it's conceptual 
I, I think that we could as easily start replacing that with housing or with other allowable uses, but I think the question is going to be, be in the first phase of the PUD, the, the shape of, of, of what it is and their exact location, the location of the water and the shape of the water, I wouldn't put a ton of stock into that because it's all going to morph and change. But yeah, there's all kinds of ways to do this and we could schematically look at that. I think it's a question of do we start doing that be kind of in the second phase, which is where I think we really start to dig into it, or do we do it as a proof in the first? We could certainly look at that. And, and I, but I don't know what we're going to be integrating to is my only thought. It might be kind of an island to start with because we don't really know what it connects to yet. We don't really know how everything integrates with it yet. We don't even know exactly how the creek trail is going to come, the Nine Mile Creek Trail is going to come in. But we don't know that for the residential, let alone we don't know for the commercial either. So all very conceptual. And one of the things that we've talked about a lot internally, and you saw when we initially ran through six alternative schemes, there were different road layouts connecting to 77th, for example, which created a different scale of blocks. But again, if, if the market is driving this thing, there needs to be flexibility there, depending upon who comes into this thing and who's interested in being here and what kind of land area they need. But with that said, I still believe that a very strong frame that is flexible could allow a variety of different kinds of land uses to, to actually fill those spaces so it doesn't necessarily shut doors on the potential of the site. It, it actually opens them if it's a flexible framework that it's set within. Commissioner Schroeder. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to... Um well, I'll start with this. First of all, I think the, the sketch plan approach we're taking is the right kind of approach for a project like this. Um, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on the notion of separating land use from architecture or site design or urban design, um, in particular because I think that the sketch plan offers us a way to better understand the relationship between the public and private realm and the spaces that exist between a street and a building, or the spaces that might exist, as you've demonstrated here, even between buildings. And I think it becomes important because you've identified some of the character of the internal and external streets, but only in terms of the public realm. And you've stopped at what might be assumed to be the right of way, but really what's framing mm -hmm. a great sketch plan and a great development is what happens between the back of the sidewalk and the building, wherever that gets to be. So I think what I would like to see is an expansion of these cross sections. And I think in order to get there, you need to start to look at building heights a little bit more. Um, you framed it in terms of uh, four stories or five stories or 12 stories. Um, but even within that architecturally, depending upon the kind of uses you might place on the first floor, your first floor might be 12 feet, or depending upon what you're trying to put behind, it might be 20 feet. So there is some need to frame building heights a little more than just stories, um, but I think it has to do with the relationship, the adjacencies between uh, the public realm, the experience on the public realm, and what's happening in the private realm. And in particular, because, and I don't know whether this was intentional, but if you get to the internal streets, you show, and I'm assuming this is the portion that's on the southwest corner of it, and you show kind of a massing of a building that might look comfortable here, but in fact, at a 12-story building, it's up here, not down here. So I think, and, and it changes the character, the experience of the street, and it changes perhaps the way that we might look at the space between the back of the sidewalk and the front of the street. So I appreciate the notion of trying to start this from a land use perspective, and I can support that. But I think one of the things that I'm really looking for is a way the sketch plan actually demonstrates the public realm experience, even if it's within the private realm, that it's experience that somebody's having on a street, and it's framed by the way they're, uh, the people are engaging buildings, or even as you get into kind of the configuration on the sites, the way the buildings are relating to one another. You show, for example, these buildings, these L-shaped buildings have spaces between, but what is that? I mean, at, at five stories, is is a 40-foot gap between the buildings even comfortable to do anything? So. You, I think you're on the right track, and I'm very supportive of what you're doing. I think there just needs to be that next level of definition for us to better understand how things are fitting together as an experience for someone who's on this site. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Schroeder. I think what I think we view this really in a similar way. We we want to get to that next step. I think the challenge that we're facing is again with a a project that is going to be market driven to a great extent. We still have to be able to get some land uses in place that we know allow for certain uses, and then be able to secure those uses, and then come back in through the second part of the PUD process, through the final part of it. And that's exactly where not only you know there's more detail from the standpoint of the sketch plan review, but there's also additional intake and additional uh, exchange with staff and with others. So uh, that that's exactly where we want to get to. Um, it, it's still, you're absolutely right, it's still very conceptual and we don't know how the relationship between public and private exactly will flow and function. And because we don't know where these buildings will go and the exact shape of them and everything else, it, it's still a little nebulous, thus the PUD process being a two-stage, two-step process. But I think um, even as you define the width of sidewalks, the relationship of the width of that sidewalk relating to a land use you're showing it in a, in a set roadway section, but it's kind of divorcing itself from the adjacent use. And that seems, I mean, it's a fine place to start. I don't think it gets far enough. And, and I, I guess um, what I'm, and maybe we'll see as this moves through the first phase of the PUD process, um, but it almost begs the question as you bring that first phase in, are we going through another sketch plan? Because it allows us the kind of dialogue we need to have and you've had, been having with us so that we really understand how these things come together. And I think um, an expansion of these concepts in a sketch plan dialogue is going to be much more beneficial for all of us than jumping into the PUD and the requirements we have for submittal documents in a PUD. Um, Commissioner Schroeder, yes, that's, I envision that we would be coming back to, for sketch plan review as part of the final PUD. That, that the process, I don't want to say it repeats itself, but we go through that same process. And, you know, candidly, I can't, I guess I'd want to turn to Carrie, I can't imagine taking a phase of this project without, through without doing that. I think what he's envisioning is getting preliminary PUD approval, but obviously the city has to be extremely comfortable in allowing that. But then if that is in place, mm -hmm. he would then come back with a sketch plan with the detail prior to a final site plan. I think that would be ideal. I think we've seen developers come forward to us without having that second phase, that kind of a sketch plan exploration of buildings, urban design, and it's been difficult for us. It's difficult for everyone, right? I mean, it's probably more difficult for you than for us. <laughs> Um, can I follow up on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we've talked about the commercial use. Um, what are you envisioning in terms of the split between office and retail as part of that commercial use? Or have you thought that um, through? We're looking at approximately 40,000 square feet of retail. There's going to be a component that will be to the south, regardless of which option, which plan or which concept would be followed. There'll be some retail to the north as well. We envision that the building where Walsh Title is currently located, especially in option two, which is the fully integrated option, could be a very dynamic and very interesting and very fun use of space as it connects into whatever that public space that's at Richards would be, uh, whether golf or not golf, an integrated space. I think Commissioner Fisher said it best. A space where we don't have fences and boundaries and barriers, where we have integration, where we have things that flow nicely in a community. So we envision that the retail, again, is going to be service retail. It's not going to be a box. It, you don't need, I've mentioned this before, I don't believe the city of Edina is in need of another grocery store. Certainly not at this site. <laughs> I, I think what oh, come we, on. <laughs> well, I can't imagine who the user would or who the occupant would be, but I, I think what the site really needs and what we envision it needs, regardless of how much commercial or what it is, it's clear what it needs, and it needs some service retail. It needs a place that people can go, that they can walk to, that they can bike to, even on a really cold day like today, that they can not jump in a car and not have to go somewhere. And they're going to want to jump in a car from whatever's developed here, and they're going to want to go to France Avenue, because France Avenue is great. They're going to want to go to Whole Foods. They're going to want to go to Byerly's. But the idea of getting in your car day after day after day and going, whether for lunch or for errands or for whatever it is, not really best practice. So that's the type of retail that we envision. Okay. So is it, it's service, it's convenience, it's places to eat, it's 
not necessarily all fast casual. It's not necessarily all linen tablecloth. It's something that's going to be service related. We think there's a very good local desire component that could be here. You happen to have a retailer, a, a restaurateur that was looking at a site that's now going to become a bank. I believe it's on Hazleton. That's the kind of operator that I think would be ideal for this site. Someone who makes a product, they're local, they don't have 20 stores, they've maybe got one or two. Uh, if we can get the Cafe Latte of the West over here, that'd be something. Um, Carrie, would you put up the, I just want to, in that context, just remind us of the, the bigger picture. I asked Carrie to pull up um, some maps of the, of the trail and where it's going to be going, and it's a little hard maybe on the screen to see it, but um, maybe you can just point out kind of where your site is along that. Um, so it's right along that, and it, you know, you can see it starts from West Edina and makes its, all, its way all the way to the Richfield border and then France Avenue. So, you know, there is a, I, I'm sure you have looked at this, but I just wanted as part of this discussion to make sure we're remembering this bigger context in this ribbon that you're right on that really can help that we ought to be thinking of this in the bigger context. Last time we talked about even without Commissioner Schroeder being here his his vision or drawing of a possibility for that southeast quadrant of Edina as well but this is a big part of it and so how do we you know as you're configuring kind of the mix of uses to be supportive also being mindful that France Avenue isn't that far away for a variety of by vehicle but also by um, bike or pedestrian um, traffic. Commissioner Forrest. I guess what I'm one thing that really struck me last time I don't know if I think it was Commissioner Potts it might have been Commissioner Fisher when he says you know the worst thing that could happen is if, if you know at six seven o'clock it goes dark and so it, that it stays a vibrant place um, throughout the day and evening would be great. And it, it's hard to balance the PUD aspect with the market aspects of it. But we're going to want some things too. And um, our comp plan was a very carefully crafted document. And it talks about things like this, like podium heights, like all of that. So that gives you kind of an idea of where we're coming from as far as vision goes, or at least that's where our vision should be stemming from, I think. So um, I, I'm getting the feeling that you're a little bit conservative compared. I think you are more enthusiastic about the same things we are than you dare let on right now <laughs> because you have to protect those business aspects as well. So I totally get that. And I also see a, even without housing, I think you need some type of service retail. I was saying a good shoe repair shop or something would be great. Um, but if you had a... Um, even, even if it's all offices and maybe restaurants and, and some retail, it, can, it, it is a vibrant community of it, in and of itself. It's, it's a, a micro community there. So I guess that's the whole thing is just keep it vibrant. So can I just from a um, <clears throat> process perspective, I want to kind of harken back to the dialogue you were having with Commissioner Schroeder. So are we envisioning that you come back for in early 2014 for preliminary PUD application, but that that wouldn't have the kind of um, relationship between public and private realm that we were discussing earlier and that that wouldn't happen until after preliminary PUD approval? Is that? I, I think the context that's, that will be needed to bring a project forward to get it so it's approved for construction is the second step. I don't think that that's going to take place in by March of 2014. There's quite a bit of additional work that will need to be done. And to take that next step, we need to know that the uses will be appropriate and allowable. We have to, we have to come back in and go through, not, we want to come back in and go through sketch plan as well as in the formal process itself. And, and that's going to be later. That might be later into 2014. It could be three months, could be six months, could be in 2015, candidly. It's, it, it's a two-step process. And I, and I think that sounds dandy. Um, but I want to make sure, Carrie, that I'm thinking, you know, I'm kind of thinking of this in the context of, um, you know, preliminary and final subdivision approval. 
or other kind of two-step processes that we have in the city. And I know sometimes the advice we get is, you know, don't go there unless you're ready. You know, it's going to be hard for you to pull the plug in step two if you haven't said no in step one. And I just want to think through that because I think this sounds like a great way to approach this, but I also want to make sure that if we're going to entertain preliminary PUD approval, that we retain the right to really weigh in on these details at the at that second step. Yeah, this is a, of great concern to me that if we approve something in preliminary form, are we then bound to approve something at final? So we want to be really clear with things that we do want in the next phase and things that we don't want. Um, so in the form of conditions and through the resolution, we need to be really clear what we're looking for in the second, the second round. So that's, I guess, um, food for thought as you try to tee up that preliminary PUD. Rem remember the pressure that's on us to make sure that we're, you know, we're going to commit a certain level if we're going to give preliminary approval. And so we need to be, we need to have the comfort that we're going to get the things that we think we need in the second step of the process. And I think as you discuss with staff and I think all of us will think more about that as well. Other questions or comments? Um, one last thing, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the TIF, and it's not really our bailiwick, but um, you, you kind of have some, these two extremes on the infrastructure. Um, is that kind of related to how much um, kind of public financing you might need to bridge a gap, or what's, can you give us a little sense of the context we're working in on the TIF discussion? Uh, certainly. I think the, there's a couple different factors that will no doubt impact what happens, you know, with potential tax increment financing district. And it, I guess starting with the first point, the, there's going to be a question of eventually which of the versions of the, which option of the plan would go forward or which is the one that, that is possible, and they have different costs associated with them. So I, I think it's important to note that there's, there's different infrastructure with, that candidly will go with both. Um, from the standpoint of, of where we're at, they, they have different costs, they have different economic models to them. We're still in the process of trying to figure out how to make those all work, and we're in a process with staff where we're going to be trading quite a bit of numbers. So it's, it's not about trying to necessarily close a gap only, it's about trying to find the right fit and the right amount of, we'll call it minimum improvements. So to give you an example, one of the things that we think is very important in whichever option, we think that a revitalized 77th is a must have. Uh, I, I obviously can't speak for anybody else, but we think whichever version of that plan would eventually happen in whichever form 77th needs to be revitalized because as a street, it's not best practice. It still needs to be a route where you get trucks in and out because you don't have that on 70th. It's not, it needs to be consistent with your comp plan. But from the standpoint of, of where the, what happens with either version, it's, it's still a little early to tell. And there, there is an impact of, with Richard's use of where that's going to go as well. That's, that's yet to be determined. So, I mean, part of the reason I raise that is, I mean, just my own personal, I, I like the more interconnected notion. Um, I don't think that's a big surprise, but, um, but I recognize that it ain't free either. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure how we um, navigate this issue about um, the existing use on the north side of the trail, um, because just having been involved in city planning processes for a little while. It's not going to happen at the time that you're... I can't imagine that we'd make a decision about that in the near future. Um, but I like this idea of, of kind of porosity or, or blurring of the lines if, if there's going to be... If we can at least get to a place about whether there's going to be a fence or not, <laughs> you know, and, and you can actually engage that space in some way. Maybe, maybe that's a, carry. I don't know, maybe that's an interim. I think that's an important thing for the council to be talking about when 
you go talk to them is how that visioning of the future of the golf course dovetails with this because that's going to be a long process I'm guessing okay other comments or questions Commissioner Fisher uh, Chair Stanton I would just as you asked the question about TIF I just thought um, even though we're not taking any votes or anything tonight I thought maybe this would be a good time to at least put on the table that um, in my professional life outside of all of this one of the things I do is tax increment finance analysis so I work with cities to determine if uh, if they're creating a TIF district does it meet the state statutes for the blighted conditions and all that kind of stuff it's looking at physical assessment and building strategy and I have been uh, hired by the city of Edina to look at this area and help make sure it meets the whatever qualifications it's going to meet and I hadn't even really thought about it. I'm kind of looking at this like this looks kind of familiar, no. um, but I, I just thought maybe I should just make sure everyone understands that. Um, but I'm, I'm working for the city, not for the developer. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. All right, I, I have one additional clarification that I wanted to make. Um, in back, and this is probably going back about 45 minutes, uh, in the height overlay. There is a section of the plan that relates to the hotel. And the reason why we shaded it, it's a lighter color of green. I don't know if we can pull that back up. Um, there's a lighter shaded green, almost looks teal, but I bet my vision's off a little bit, where Tom is indicating. And the reason that we wanted to talk about that that may conceptually be taller than what the comp plan allows, taller than what your tax currently allows, and I can't tell you that I know what the height is. It may be more complementary to what you have at the old Radisson or Doubletree, which is across on the other side of 100. It may not. I think it would be very disingenuous if anyone, if we were to come in here and say, we think it needs to be 15 stories, 18 stories, 13 stories, whatever it is. We don't honestly know. I don't know. And so I, I have to, I'm not throwing myself on my sword here. I'm simply saying, when we come back at some point, hopefully to talk about the second phase of the PUD. We have to have some real specifics, not just on architecture and on how everything relates, but also on height. And I, I think it would be wrong if we came back and said, well, now we're looking at this and it's a brand new idea. We're not asking you to approve more height. We simply want to frame it now because it's something for that one single piece of the south parcel, not the whole parcel, but that one single part of the south parcel may be necessary for a particular hoteler's business model to have maybe a taller building, but it may be less of a monolithic building. A 12-story building that's real thick, that's real long, may not in the end be as attractive or desirable for anybody. So I simply wanted to frame the issue and just make it clear that we, we would like to ask that we can come back and have that discussion with some information, with some context. If we don't have enough vision to at least frame that, shame on us. That's why I wanted to bring it up. So fair enough, but um, let me ask this then. Do, you, do, do, the, do your needs for the um, preliminary PUD approval that you described earlier, the kind of business needs that you've got to fulfill, do they require you to get comprehensive plan changes by the end of March of 2014? No, they do not. All right. So at least that could be put off till the second phase of the PUD. I, I believe it has to be until there's real context or real yeah. fact. It's not appropriate to discuss it. We, we needed to frame the issue, have a discussion. Right. It's appropriate that we at least talk a little bit about it, but we don't have any fact or context with yeah. it to give you. So All right. it, it's just important that we had the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a much smarter way to go at it. Commissioner Potts. And maybe I could just add to that, trying to emphasize the point that Commissioner Schroeder made. I think as you talk about building heights and volumes and floor plates, you're talking about you know, very often financially driven elements of the project. As you, as you talk about land use, you're talking about infrastructure, the streets, the green spaces, the stormwater, things like that. I think what's very important is what lies in between those two, at least for Commissioner Schroeder, for me, I think for a lot of us here, are the spaces created by the buildings that the people move through, whether it's on foot or on wheels. We're looking for you know, certainly more of that once you can give it to us. Yes. Commissioner Carr. 
I was just looking at, uh, Carrie again, I was looking at the compliance table and it, uh, the pr proposed PUD compared to the city standards, I mean, it looks like on setbacks, setbacks would actually be greater than they currently are. I just want to verify my interpretation of that. Potentially, again, we don't know the heights. It depends if, um, I believe w with the plan from 2008, there were some podium heights where the, the mass of the, the buildings were set more into the, the building. I just wanted to highlight w here that the setbacks that were being shown, but again, the height will determine whether they actually meet the setback or okay, not. Okay, okay. And so, and then the building height though, that would be a, a variation on the five stories. Five stories would be a variation from yeah. current code. And then on the uh, maximum floor area ratio, Prior, uh, well, currently it's got non-residential and residential, and then the proposed PUD is just for non-residential. Should it be, is the PUD framed as only non-residential, or would you frame it as both residential and non-residential to give the option to the applicant? Yeah, we'll want to frame that up to give them the option. That's something I think that's going to be really important as part of this next, the, the preliminary approvals that we at least have those numbers um, pretty well down. Just what kind of densities are we gonna allow here in terms of square footage for non-residential and residential? And then again, you know, if you take a look at the uh, code requirements and considerations for a PUD, it does include a somewhat, some detail in there that we're not seeing right now. So that's the dilemma, I think, with the preliminary PUD versus a final one, and that the preliminary does not include some of the standards or requirements uh, that deal with many different things, whether they're sustainable design, um, landscaping, lighting, storm water, storm water management. So is your intent when you come back with the final PUD to give more detail, and is that because you are now going to have some actual building proposals in mind at that time? Yes, after yeah. March after March 31st of 14, some period of time will pass, and then we'll be back with specifics and detail. But I think the, the intention is that we, we want to talk, I, I know we've talked, I've talked a lot about stormwater management that's an amenity, that, that's not just a necessity, that, that's pretty nebulous. That, that may sound good or it may not sound very specific, it's probably both. To not talk about that would be wrong, but also we're gonna propose things that we believe are very consistent with it. We're not going to bring something forward to you that staff doesn't feel is consistent. We're, we're not in that case going to, we don't believe in pushing water uphill, but we also are gonna to need to go through a full sketch plan and full process so that that's all vetted. Okay, and then just from a, a legal standpoint, I don't know if the city attorney has reviewed, or maybe you understand the concept, of what the legal ramifications are of approving a preliminary PUD versus granting final approval, but it might be nice to clear that up so that in fact, if we do approve the preliminary PUD, the city does not have legal ramifications if at the end of the day we did not approve the final PUD. Absolutely, I have big worries on that. That's why I want to be clear that with any preliminary approval, we have to say that at final, you will have whatever it is, sustainable design. Maybe we put a measurable on that. It will be X amount of energy savings. We need to be clear in that preliminary approval what we're expecting at the final. Yeah, the trick is going to be the level of detail and yes. the conditions and the expectation that it creates for the applicant. Yeah, because it sounds as though, I mean, the applicant might rely on, we don't want the applicant to rely on the preliminary PUD and then come back and be surprised. But, of course, the PUD requirements are set forth in the code, so the applicant does have to come back with a plan that meets the requirements of the code, but I think whatever approvals we do, when we, the, the, final, the approval at the preliminary level has to make all that very clear, I think, so we don't have a problem later on. And I'm sure you're aware of that as well. So the lawyers among us up here are, uh, are anxious, <laughs> but we're always anxious. <laughs> I, I think there's, I think there's, in a sense, there's risk. There, there's risk 
from every perspective. And I, I think, you know, there is risk from our perspective as well. Uh, not only the investment of time and energy and brain cells to bring a final plan forward, but also to market and integrating and get things rolling. So in a, in a strange sense, while the process may not seem perfect because it's not fully designed with each piece, you know, as of March 31st, there's a good context, there's a good working understanding, there's a lot of dialogue. We've been, well, we haven't been into the planning commission. We have been in the midst of the city since September 4th of 2012, talking and listening mostly, but also talking a lot really since April. So there is a lot of dialogue and there's a lot of public discussion about best practices, how we're going to be green, how we're going to be integrated, what we're going to do. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what we can rely on, and candidly, we can't go pull a building permit with the preliminary PUD approval. We can't. We need to get to that final stage, and I believe also the city will also very much wish to get to that final stage. We're going to be cooperative with each other because the way it is today, there's nobody that truly likes it the way it is today. We all want this to be better. It's just about finding the right balance point. And I, and I think we've, I think where it's come from up until now has been terrific, and you, you guys are doing a, a great job of, of really trying to get this right. It, I think you just need to know that this is an issue we're going to have to navigate when you come back for the, the formal p preliminary PUD approval. We're going to have to figure out how to make, how to make it work for both sides. Sure. So. Yep, Commissioner Kerr. Uh, one other question. Uh, is it possible to come um, to the uh, City Council and the Commission with a request for a preliminary PUD on just the north property without the south? I mean, it's, it sounds as though your intent is to develop the north property first and have more <clears throat> development plans for that. Uh, would it be possible, because what I'm concerned about is that you, if the grant covers quite a bit of land and the request would be ultimately um, to approve a final PUD without necessarily all the details behind it, uh, or even a preliminary one, uh, but if we could get quite a bit of detail on the north piece of the property, could you do a PUD just on that property without a decision on the other property? Um, to, to address the which phase I believe will be first, Commissioner Carr, I actually, it probably will be the south. Now, that, that could change. It could end up being the north, but uh, I, I think actually the south may come first, but whichever part comes first. We've oh, yeah, excuse me. The, uh, the, I may have gotten my directions wrong. The uh, green property is the one you're going to develop near 100? Yes. Yeah. Um, That's but south. It, it I, well I, I made a mistake on my first. directions there. <laughs> it could be the north first, though. You, you, it's hard to know, but I, I think the way that we viewed this is that we really feel that we need to get the zoning together and, and comprehensively understood for both, for all of it. And we also think that taking it in pieces in this, in that case from a zoning standpoint would not be a good decision on our part and actually in the end may end up not being beneficial for the city either. Um, I, it, it's, it's my opinion that these parcels belong together and they belong together and they should be integrated together, not just because of option two, but because they, they actually do interact together, but they interact very poorly together right now. So I, my opinion is, and the approach we've taken is, we feel they should be together. There are some other challenges with not doing them together, such as the amount of uh, FAR. There's a variety of other issues that we've talked about with staff of if we try to take this in pieces, and we really, I don't want to speak for Carrie and staff, but we have felt from our perspective, from our team's perspective, that looking at this as PUD affords a lot of good flexibilities, but it also has some very high standards and some wide scrutiny that is still available for the Planning Commission and the City Council and the community as each piece comes back and then integrates together. Um, there's still going to be quite a bit of, dis a lot of discussion, a lot of scrutiny, and a lot of commenting. It's, this is the first stage of a very long process. Commissioner Grable. Uh, I, I agree that this has got to be one thing as well rather than split into two because what happens down on the south, what happens in the north depends on what happens on the south and so on. So I think it's right that it should be a consolidated deal. My concern, and we've been down this road on this parcel before, is 
the big plans come along and then nothing happens. And I'm just, I'm curious about, and I apologize because I was not at the last meeting, so you probably already covered this, but what is your plan for the phases? How's that gonna happen? What's the length of time that this is gonna take? And, and, uh, and I guess the ultimate question is, uh, you know, how do we know you're going to do it all? Well, uh, I come from a peer group of wonderful overpromisers and underdeliverers. Um, I think to Commissioner Forrest's comment, we are, I don't want to say we're holding in back in reserve a little bit, but our company policy, and it's been this way since 48, has been don't overpromise and don't underdeliver. And that's what we said when we came to the city council back on the 4th of September 2012. Judge us on results. Don't judge us on only what we're saying. Judge us on results. And we wanted the community to see what we were doing in the stabilized Pentagon Park because the place looked like a bomb hit it. That having been said, PUD is so consistent with, I think, answering part of, part of your question because the PUD, this is a multi-phase, very long duration project. There is no instant gratification out there. The, the days of the best buys coming in and sucking down a 40 or a 60 acre site, those days are not here. They may come back one day, but they do not exist today. What exists today is much more modest development. It, it exists in a smaller context. And also the concept of instant, I don't want to use the word gratification, but need has never been higher. Users are in trouble. The Great Recession has changed the commercial market dramatically where when somebody needs to do something, they need to go much more quickly. If, if, if the market conditions and the circumstances were different, we would probably be taking a two-phase PUD from my perspective has a lot of risk for us as a, as a development team, as an investor. But it's the best possible outcome because we can then go on each part in a much more expedient fashion and we also have a context that users can come in and know that it's real. So getting to your question about phasing, I personally believe that 2014 will be the year of the planning for this project on the south phase. I believe 2014 will be the year of, I sure hope this is the case, demolition <laughs> on the south parcel. And I believe that 2015 will be the year of the infrastructure and the shovel where things actually happen on the south parcel. I, I am trying not to be overzealous, but I really believe that. To the north, we think that the, the project is going to phase its way from west to east. Uh, we had to make decisions of which end of this project to stabilize because this project was so dysfunctional. It had a lot of clients in it. Some buildings had 2,000 feet of leases in a 50,000 square foot building. We've done all that triage. We've done all that work. We've consolidated all the tenants basically into five or six buildings. They're mostly to the north and to the east and we have the ability to be flexible with those uses and eventually change that product over time. So in a strange sense, what makes good development? What, or maybe what makes poor development? A lot of times I'm guessing people come in here and say, I gotta have it right now. I, I, we're, we, time is everything, time's a major pressure. But you've heard that before. <laughs> well, and we're in here talking about a time standpoint of March 31st, which is a, a pretty assertive, aggressive timeline, but the, from the standpoint of the development, I do feel that time is our friend in a sense because we really can try to find the right uses, the right approach to this. So at the end, we have a lot of incentive to take these buildings from an investor standpoint and not have them be 1960s eras, intelligently renovated but not over-renovated buildings. We needed to make them relevant. We needed to make them code compliant. We've done that. We needed to satisfy code, which was not satisfied before. But we didn't go so far that we can't reverse and get it to the highest and best use because candidly, this is my opinion, you guys deserve more. The community deserves more, the site deserves more, and 10 years from now if we're standing here and if a lot of this hasn't happened, there's been a massive failure. I, I think the plan that was here before, was it was driven by, it had to go instantaneous, it was so ambitious, it was all gonna be a not just one phase, but maybe a couple phases, but very aggressive. That's not what this is. We're going to be patient. Uh, I've said before that uh, Mark and I are going to be patient from the standpoint of we're, we're around working on this in eight years and we're going methodically. We're comfortable with that. If it happens in two or three years, 
I'm not going to have hardly any hair left, but we're going to be comfortable with that too. So there are, I guess what I'm saying is they're truly in the end, the market conditions will help bear it, but there are no assurances, but we have a wonderful backstop <clears> of <throat> it, parts of this will be stabilized. And at the end, I think we can wait, even if we have to wait an extra year or two toward the last phases, it'll be okay. It will be okay. Commissioner Carr. Well, I just wanted to say after your explanation on the reasons for not separating the parcels and part of the PUD process, I agree with that too. I think you've got a vision. Tying the properties together makes sense. But again, I just go back to the um, potential risk involved in granting a preliminary versus a final PUD without the details. So I guess as much detail as you can have was going to be helpful. Well, and I think there are examples of some of the creative work that you and staff can be doing as you're teeing this up. I think you get what our concern is, and we'll leave it to you guys to try and figure that out. I'd note that your colleague, Mr. Close, I don't know what happened out in the parking lot, but he seems to be in the police department now. So. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, things may have gone south for him this evening. Um, uh, any other comments before we uh, before we let these uh, these folks go for, and retrieve their colleague? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here this evening. Thank you. Thank and you. we will be uh, we intend on being back a lot. All right. Well, we look Thank forward you. to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks again. All right, so next up on the agenda is uh, correspondence and petitions, um, council connection, and uh, Jackie's summary memo. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Uh, from Scott Neal to ED everyone. Um, kind of summarizing the council meeting from December 3rd, as well as the attendance sheet, so everybody if, you, if there's any uh, errors in the attendance sheet, uh, please bring them to Jackie's attention. Uh, and then we come to, um, I don't know, Carrie, is there anything else under miscellaneous in correspondence and petitions? Okay. Uh, so next up is Chair and Commission Member comments. Uh, this would be a good time if we have any liaison reports from various uh, work that folks are doing to report in on that. Commissioner Platter, Commissioner Carr, trying to decide who's going to do which. Just realized she wasn't there, so I'll probably have to do it. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, last Wednesday we had a, another Living Streets, and uh, what what came out of that is uh, staff has put together at least a a draft of of coming together on that. So we had some reviews on that. So hopefully soon we'll have a, a revised draft of of the policy. And uh, one thing I asked about is, you know, when can we, I guess, start implementing it more because things like this come through with, you know, Pentagon Park and we could take advantage of those situations and start to implement some of the pieces with that. So um, that's part of the discussion as well. So we're working through that over the next couple couple months, but it seems like it's come together really, rather nicely right now. Very good. Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Platter and I are working on a tree protection ordinance. And as you note, uh, uh, we heard from uh, Cindy today on the, uh, some of the complaints have to do with tree removal, but this is a ordinance um, aimed at preserving and protecting trees, significant trees that might be affected during construction. And we hope to have a draft uh, to you for the January meeting to take a look at. Very good. It's been on our work plan for um, quite some time, so I'm glad to hear that you're taking leadership on uh, moving forward with that. Commissioner Fisher. The uh, Grandview uh, Committee is continuing to meet twice a month. We're making progress, um, working on our second draft of an RFI, a request for interest from developers to partner with us on the development of the Public Works property. Um, and you know what we're looking for is, as it's shaping up is really, it's not, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but I'll just keep reminding people in case anyone's watching, it's not about hiring a developer to come in with their proposal to you know, build you know, you know, competing proposals. It's, it's really having a developer come on and work with us to develop the public property and, um, and following the framework that's already been developed. So 
we're drafting that RFI, but at the same time, uh, we're, we have a consultant working with us to conduct a survey um, throughout the community to talk about, to try to find out what some potential public uses might be on that site and to define that a little bit more than it was defined in the, in the uh, framework. So we're hoping to actually that, that that'll take place relatively soon. We're, we're having a work session with the council, I believe January 20th or 21st. I can't remember which, which one of those days 21st. it is. Is it the 21st? Um, where we'll bring some of this draft information to them and have a discussion, update the council and get their feedback. Commissioner Forrest. Yeah, I noticed in the Sun Current that the walk with the mayor this Saturday at Southdale, that they were going to be discussing redevelopment in the city. So if anybody's interested in that topic and if somebody's watching this, maybe they are. So if, you, if that's your hobby, that might be something you want to attend. Very good, good reminder. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Fisher, for that update and for that note. Commissioner Forrest, any other uh, comments from the commission? Staff comments, Carrie, anything? <laughs> A uh, couple things, just quickly. You noticed in the Manager Neal <coughs> summary of the last uh, council meeting that the council did um, go along with the recommendation on that Hawks Lake subdivision, and that project was denied. The council also approved the ordinance amendment to clarify the residential redevelopment um, ordinance that we talked about at our last meeting. And another item is we've been going through, we've hired a codifier to recodify the whole city code. It's not making any substantive changes, but organizing and making things um, <clears throat> a little bit more clear. The council will be taking action on that at their next meeting. So the first of the year, all these references to 850, 830 will have all new numbers. <laughs> so we will get copies out to everyone on the commission. Um, Should we just do colors instead of numbers? <laughs> that might help. I just <laughs> Um, on that note, I, I just piggybacking on what um, Carrie said, I, I understand in the work session there was some discussion uh, led by um, some folks talking about um, the Southwest Light Rail and what impact it might have on the city and housing and the like. And um, it, it triggered a couple of thoughts in terms of our 2014 work plan where um, we're going to do a little bit of a midterm check-in on the comprehensive plan, and I think some of those discussions will be relevant to the group that's putting that together. Um, and also, um, there was some discussion, as I understand it, at the council about how to incorporate some affordable housing standards into our PUD approval process. And I know we're, that's also something, along with sustainability and pedestrian friendliness, that we want to incorporate into our PUD um, process. So. Those are, it's good to hear that the council is thinking along the same lines we are in terms of the things that need to be followed up on. All right, anything else for the good of the realm? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Fisher? As a junior member? <laughs> is there a second? I second. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.